Welcome to another Ozarks Voices Oral History Interview, a project of Missouri State University Libraries and its Ozarks Studies Institute Initiative. I'm Craig Amison with the University Libraries, and today's date is Monday, March 9th, 2020. Our special guest is Mr. Jared Gettle, founder and owner of Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, and we are here on site in Mansfield, Missouri. Thank you so much for allowing us to interview you. Appreciate you being here. It's yes, an honor. Sir. Just for the record, can you start off by telling us when and where you were born? I was born in Napa, Idaho in uh, 1980, so it was uh, in basically in Boise Valley, uh, you know, and I grew up in the Oregon, right on the Oregon border, Oregon-Idaho border in a little town called Adrian. Okay, and um, how, did your, how did your family settle in the area of Baker Creek here in Wright County? After living out west for um, all of my, you know, young years, till I was about 12 years old, uh, my parents and all my relatives lived on the west coast or northwest, so uh, they, they finally decided it was time to check out another part of the country when I was about 12, almost 13, and we were traveling across southern Missouri, and my mom and dad stumbled upon this place at their real estate office, and we moved here in 90, 93, yes. So no particular reason to come here other than just a nicer climate or... A little warmer climate, uh -huh. and uh, it's cheaper land, and you know, year-round, more year-round water. You know, we didn't have to worry about uh, things staying green as much. For the my dad was raising cattle at the time, so it was a just a overall more land, you know, and uh, just a play, a little warmer climate, and a nice green place, and a quiet kind, kind of a quiet place to grow up, I guess. So. Right, and so cattle was his primary. At that point, yeah, he was doing point. cows. I was small, yeah. so. and and the Ozarks are a good place for. A good place for yeah. cows or uh, any kind of grazing livestock. And um, was uh, was that what your father was doing? What your parents were doing when you were growing up? That, too? My dad did other types of farming when I was real small, like in uh, Idaho and Oregon area. He do, did a lot of corn farming, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the, our small place there, and they grow veg big vegetable gardens and fruit trees, and grew a lot of our own produce and gathered a lot of our own food from the area all, all my growing up years especially when we lived in Idaho and Oregon and Montana area it was always you know a lot of growing our own food uh-huh uh, any siblings one sister okay um, tell us a little bit about your formative years you know what was what was life like what what did you do for fun what did you did you work with your parents did you did you work on the land did yeah, growing up, I pretty much, uh, you know, all summer long, I spent the summer outside. I was either in the garden or fishing or uh, collecting arrowheads or picking asparagus or doing something outdoors. There wasn't really any, uh, when I was real young, there wasn't many, uh, you know, games on. There was no cell phones or anything like that. So right. people were, especially in that area of the country, the Northwest, it's even today, a lot of people do outdoor activities, you know, especially in the summer months. And in the winter, it was still a lot of activities. But one of the things, uh, you know, outdoor activities, but one of the things I enjoyed when I was really small was looking through seed catalogs. Um, I kind of, uh, that's what inspired me to want to learn to read was, you know, looking through a seed catalog when I was really small because, uh, and learning about the histories and stories of the vegetables. It was, even at a very young age, was very fascinating to me. It was more than just a vegetable. I wanted to learn, you know, where it came from, the, you know, a Japanese radish, for instance. You know the story behind it. it was fascinating to think about people passing these varieties down and that was has always been one of my main hobbies anything outdoors that i love you know whether it's mushrooms or taking a hike or kayaking or boating all that kind of stuff when i was small we did a lot of outdoor activities so it was always connected with you know nature as a child i guess so. yeah and, and your parents had seed catalogs around the house they did my family and my my not only my parents but my grandma grandmas and uh especially my grandmothers, but also all my aunts and uncles pretty much threw, threw in vegetable gardens, and still everybody in Boise Valley pretty much has a vegetable garden. You just, what you do, the soil's so good and the climate's good there for growing stuff, so right. pretty much everybody throws out some vegetables. So everybody compares notes, and whether it's at church or community events, they're always taking right. vegetables to this event or that event because everybody always has extra vegetables, so they're always sharing their melons or wherever they go. They're always trying to trade or swap so just grew up around a lot of produce and fruit uh, you know amazing fruit country in Boise Valley it's uh -huh. like it's like Central Valley in California but with right. a, a winner this is the only difference but you have every kind of fruit imaginable besides like citrus and kiwis but all the stone fruit and right. apples and all of that is you know and then of course watermelons and melons and any kind of you know garden produce so it was so much produce that you know I just became fascinated from an early age at the diversity and colors you know 
cutting open an orange watermelon or a yellow watermelon and seeing all the colors yeah. and also noticing the insects in the garden. I think that also fascinated me to the gardening was seeing all the life when you're only, you know, a couple of feet tall and <laughs> eye level with it all happening. It's kind of, a, you know, fascinating to you when you don't have a, a computer game or something to play. Sure, and a lot of young children are very interested in insects, I think, naturally. Just, yeah, just appeals to, yeah, the little yeah. creatures yeah. watching things happen in the So you can see them up close. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's a, and, and your extended family was pretty close to you. Uh, both my distance, grandmothers yeah. lived right near me. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, uh, one of my grandfathers as well. So, And then my great-grandmother as well would be there part of the time. So wow. Until I was about four years old, and then she passed away. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I grew up gardening around grandmothers. One of my grandmothers was uh, Mexican and the other was more of a, like a Danish background. So, But they would garden together as well both on both, from both sides of the family and share plants. And sometimes I'd garden with both of them. So it was always fun. One of the things I like to do is hide the garden tools from them and then they'd have to find them. So, but uh, it was always, you know, always good experiences in the garden. And, uh, and, you know, fishing and outdoors and, you know, looking for rocks and all that. For kids, I mean, I think it's important to not just gardening, but the whole, you know, outdoors experience, yeah. whether it's gardening or rock collecting or whatever hobbies. And my family is very much into, not, not, not necessarily my mom and dad, but, you know, my extended family, all of them have outdoor hobbies. My mom and dad have theirs and, you know, yeah. my aunts and uncles, everybody has some, you know, whether it's rock collecting or arrowhead collecting. So they all are all looking for things when we're outside. It's not just like taking a walk. We all, they always have a purpose. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. And and how did you feel about coming to uh, Missouri? At, at I was excited. Um, I was, you know, when I looked on the map and seen how far south it was, and of course it was before the internet, so I was hoping it would be a warmer climate. I was like, wow, that much farther south will really be warm, you know. But it, we still have a winter here. That part was a little bit of a letdown. I was thinking it was going to be more like northern Louisiana or, you know, something like that. But, uh, it was, uh, it was definitely fun, though. When in the summertime, it was just like I imagined it, you know, everything hot and humid and tropical. and Yeah fish in the rivers and snakes and you know it was uh, yeah, you know. Did, did the climate end up being what your father expected it to be you think I, th I think uh, I'll, quite a bit a little colder in the winter than we'd planned uh -huh. uh, of course the humidity is a little harder than you you know when you until you get used to it it's more right. of a shock a little sticky yeah. but uh, other than that it's uh, been a been a good you know most uh, spring and falls are beautiful in general so. absolutely did uh, your parents house here uh, is it still here and it is. I actually grew up in the house right near here, so yeah. Just okay. To, do you live in that house now, or you, I do? Yeah. You, you still live in that house? I live there. Oh yeah. wow. So, yeah. Me and How my cool wife is that? And kids live there. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, you started gardening at a very young age, correct? Correct. Yeah. I basically gardened since like before I can remember. So. so that passion just came from being around it so much. I, I think of being around it and being around family. Everybody was gardening at that point in my life, so it was kind of like. It just uh, happened, I guess. And especially seed propagation. That caught your imagination somehow. It did, yeah. Looking through seed catalogs, even when I was like four years old, I remember uh, three and four years old looking through the seed catalogs and thinking someday, you know, I wanted to work for a seed company, you know, imagining uh, the seed companies of the day, like Journeys out of Yankton, South Dakota, and thinking how neat it would be to visit and, you know, someday be able to work there and imagining, you know, all the drawers and envelopes and packaging and all that and marketing, uh, you know, right. that whole, the whole seed catalog industry and catalog industry in general still is very interesting to me beyond just seed catalogs but you know all the different different catalogs not just here in the united states but you know foreign you know J japanese catalogs and so right. forth seeing how they marketed and how they made it work it was kind sure. of a relatively recent concept you know as in maybe the last couple hundred years so it's something that has been a Sort of a, you know, almost of an American idea, but it's also kind of happened other places almost at the same time. Interesting. Were, were, were the catalogs that you were looking at as a child, were they well illustrated? They were. The uh, seed catalogs were quite colorful, although a lot of times it was artwork even in the 80s. It wasn't necessarily all, all photos. Uh -huh. They were still using, even though the technology was there, a lot of the companies were still using kind of older methods to produce their catalogs. Right. So a lot of it was still artwork in the 80s. And then by the 90s, most catalogs had kind of gotten rid of most of their artwork, although there's still a few today. They're still using the same illustrations they were using in the... Yeah, it's almost like almanacs. Yeah, like they, they, some catalogs, especially when the, you know, the founder gets settled in a, in a way, it's really hard to switch. So, you know, you start, you're 20 years old and you did it a certain way and now you're sure. 75 and you're still doing the same, 
you know. Yeah, it's, I, and I, I've, I've often wondered about that when they went from illustrations to photograph, you know, that, that sort of artistic skill uh, sort of went away. Yeah, a lot of, and I kind of, I kind of miss the, you know, the artwork and the catalogs yeah. and the colored, hand colorized photos and on and on. There's so much, uh, you know, it changed so much, you know, from, the printing of catalogs changed and the internet was all coming on the scene yeah. and technology and printing presses and everything was changing basically you know in the 80s and 90s and 2000s so it was a uh, totally and when we started the business it was you know here it was we were right in that change so that's sure. kind of an interesting time you know the whole basically I, I grew up before the internet and you know came right into the internet basically sure. in my early mid-teen years is basically yeah. the first time I used the internet it was about probably Four to fifteen years old, so it was, you know, and yeah. now kids grow up without any of that. So sure. it's kind of a, I'm, I'm going I'm to actually get back to that because that's an interesting um, whole avenue. Um, you, you got you, you have a pretty interesting story about how you started distributing and selling seeds. Um, tell us a little bit about that. You were you were interested in in in, um, in selling the seeds that you had at a at a fairly young age. Yeah, I, I remember you know early on you know thinking about. Uh, you know, how to, how to someday work for a seed company or start a seed company. And I started collecting uh, seed catalogs whenever I'd see the advertisements in magazines. And a lot of the seed catalogs at the time, I would order the catalogs and a year or two later, the seed company would, these smaller seed companies would go bankrupt or the owner would die and they would disappear like Leckler Seedsman and the tomato company out of New Jersey and several others. Or the varieties in the catalogs were starting to disappear too. And some of the more established companies that were a little bigger, the, the company might still be in business, but the things that I was familiar with would disappear out of the catalog. So I started thinking that it would be fun to somehow help save these varieties. Uh -huh. And I joined different seed group organizations and uh, started trading seeds with members of Seed Savers Exchange and other organizations for a couple of years. And I thought, i got to put out a little price list. I don't know if it will work, but I might, might as well give it a try. And that was in 1998. So. And you were, what, 17? 17. And, oh, wow. Uh, Put out the price list and it was slow you know we sold about a thousand dollars worth of seeds and i was like yeah this is a fun hobby but you know i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it going as a hobby but i didn't know if it would be a business or not right. the next year was 1999 and right before y2k and it, the business went from like four a thousand dollars to forty thousand dollars so it was like <laughs> enough to like think that this might be something maybe we can get a business going but then I, you also think this is well. This is 1999. This might be a, you know next year is all year, over. Yeah. So, but it, it wasn't. It, you know the next year was about the same, and then from there on out, it's growing every year. So. Wow. But what, it's, uh, um, did you have uh, an interest specifically um, in in some plants more than others? Or the seeds of some plants more than others, or or just any plant? Uh, any plant, but it, I, there would be certain ones I was more interested in. It kind of changes from year to year, too. Yeah. I'll be really in just one crop for a while and try to collect seeds and search out seeds. And then once I've found all that I think I can find or, you know, as much as I can from that point, something else will come up. You uh -huh. know, it's continuously happening. We just found a seed I was looking for all over in the U.S. And a friend who goes to Japan, who works in Japan part-time, finally found the seed again in Japan. So a lot of times we will find something that we can't find here in the U.S. and it's like extinct here potentially, will pop up somewhere else, either in Europe or Japan or China, and yeah. South Africa, who knows where, but it'll pop up if we keep looking for it. Oftentimes these varieties are, con and that's what, that's really, you know, what makes it fun is the searching process. Your first catalog, what was, uh, what was the inventory then? We had about 75 varieties in the first mm -hmm. catalog. Were they mostly vegetables? It was mostly vegetables, yeah. Uh -huh. So and just standard vegetables? It was assortment of unique vegetables, mostly unique stuff that I grew here. The first year, everything pretty much came out of the garden here, all the seed that was in the catalog. Do you remember what you sold the most of? I can't remember the first year. Those yeah. Curious. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember. It wasn't a whole lot of anything. So. <laughs> um, that, that first catalog, so that's, that's the genesis of this company you have today, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, correct? Correct. And um, you, I guess maybe yeah, like in the beginning you thought maybe this is just a hobby, or but but you were already envisioning a business because you you had that idea of how fun it would be to be part of a seed company. Um, with, at that early age, were you thinking, oh, someday I'm going to be the head of the seed company? 
I didn't really know. Yeah, I was hoping to, you know, do something in seats. And, you know, it was the first year it was the scariest because you didn't know how it was going to take off. And, you know, then the second year was scary. And then after that, it kind of moderated, you know, it was. Became, yeah. But it wasn't really a livable, you know, company for probably about, I don't know, five or six years before it was making enough to kind of like support me, really. So the first. Well, yeah, I'm sort of curious about that. I mean, were you even old enough legally to own a business at that time? I mean, could you, could you, could it be yours or was it your parents? Or? Um, at that point, it wasn't, well, it was just a doing business as for a number of years. Uh-huh. So it wasn't really, I mean, I guess anybody can own a business at any age, but it's like where it wasn't uh, technically, the government didn't consider it, it was really basically at that point just like selling on eBay or something. Uh-huh, yeah. It was like a hobby business, but it wasn't really a registered business in the early years. You know, it was just a, it's that's like funny. somebody that's selling stuff online, you know, it's kind of a loose, it's a business, but it's not really a, you know, a, it's not really doing enough sales to really be noticed by anybody, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's like selling some, you know, selling right. maybe stamps on eBay. It's kind of a. So what year did you incorporate? Um, as far as we, oh, that's a good question. I can't remember now. Uh, we got the LLC and then we got a C Corp a couple of years. Well, I don't know. It might be eight years, six years ago, something okay. like that. So, okay. But for a number of years, we were under an LLC and uh-huh. we switched. But right. It, we, we probably weren't anything, though, for the first 10 years, probably, I'm guessing, yeah. eight or 10 years. Was that a learning curve when you... I didn't know anything about it and I still really don't. <laughs> I mean, I let other people have all the business paperwork. Yeah, that's one of the hardest... Uh, you know, dealing with taxes, uh-huh. and, you know, not that I'm against the whole process. It's just figuring out the paperwork to get it right, you know. It's, right. And a lot of times the accountants around in this neighborhood, sometimes they struggle with the paperwork just like we do because it's sure. business questions. And that's the biggest struggle overall in the business is figuring out both the technology side, making sure you're up to date all the time right. between, uh, you know, potential viruses or hackers to... Uh, the mounds of paperwork, you know, for every state and every oh, every state and, you know, country requirements for shipping internationally. So that's, sure. paperwork is our biggest uh, challenge every yeah. year. So. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned the, the Y2K scare had such a positive impact on your young enterprise. I think that's fascinating. Um, I guess you could, you, you couldn't sense at first that the business was taking off because that, because that could have just been a one shot. But then you said that continued. Um, why do you think it continued? Well, I think partly the Y2K year, uh, 1999, got people to know about us a little more. And then once they knew about us, a lot of them came back and got seeds again the following year and told their neighbors about us. And it gave us a little bit of money also to advertise a little bit. So that helped us just basically lift us off the ground enough to get us going. That's fabulous. Um, and we printed our actually first colored catalog the year after Y2K. It was just on by a little River Wave printing company down here in Mountain View, Mountain View, Missouri. So, and from there on out, we had color. The first two years, it was all black and white, and just on a Xerox in Springfield, go in, print them all off, staple yeah. them together. And then after a while, they I think they started stapling for us on a little stapler. But it was all you know hand stamped. And the first year, it was all like we didn't even have address labels. It was all these handwritten labels on them. So. And. Uh, you, you were doing this uh, by yourself? Did you have any help? The first year was all myself, you know, just in my bedroom. And right. the second year, it had basically taken over the upstairs of the house, and I started getting part-time helpers, mostly like neighbor kids and oh, yeah. neighbors or relatives that could come and help here and there, you know, to keep up because it was getting busier. And uh, it was really busy, especially late in the year in 1999. Everybody was like, it got busier and busier through the year. So. Was that sort of hectic? It was, because it, we didn't really know what we were doing, and it, you know, it was really quiet the year before, so it was a, you know, a 40 times increase, so it was trying to like, figure out. And we really didn't know what we were doing. You know, we didn't really have any licenses for any like, seed licenses or anything, and it, then the government really didn't, you know, when you're real small, they don't really pay much attention anyway. But all that, you know, we found out most stuff by people telling us, hey, you need this uh-huh. or you need yeah. that over the years. So. Uh, so, so you're like in your late teens and you're already an employer. Right, you get part time. A little bit, it's yeah. Was, uh, right? And then from there on out, we had, uh, you know, from we had part time employees, seasonal, I think, in 2000. And after 2000, I think we pretty much started to get like 2001, 2002, we started getting a couple full time uh-huh. year round people that would help out. So, carry us through how the business expanded from there. 
Um, and your and your family expanded too. Right? Yeah, it was uh, basically we went from you know there to uh, from basically printing a uh, thousand catalogs. Well. 500 catalogs the first year to, you know, a few thousand, I think 6,000 catalogs in Y2K. And then from there, it's just jumped every year. You know, with, within a few years, it was up to like, uh, I think within like three years, it was up to 60,000 catalogs. And, uh, and now this year, we did just over 1 million catalogs total. So it was, uh, we also uh, did the whole seed catalog this year, which is, uh -huh. a, We've done it actually for several years. We've expanded it a little bit more this year even, but uh, it's on the newsstand. So that's uh, one of the things we're doing now is actually getting a catalog, which I first came up with the idea for that from uh, seeing a Bass Pro Shops catalog on the newsstand. And then oh, yeah. also the old uh, whole Earth catalogs from right. the 70s, right. looking at through those. But uh, so that's basically it went from, you know, the 12-page uh, catalog to uh, the whole, this whole seed catalog is now like 450 pages. And, it, and we have the regular catalog as well, which is free, and the whole seed catalog is actually, people buy that. Right. So that's basically, you know, what we've, what we've tried to do is include more and more educational history in, in the catalogs, mm -hmm. as well as a lot of different varieties. And so yeah. it's basically, in a nutshell, you know, it's, uh, you know, growing every year. Uh, 19, or 1998 and 99, of course, was a big jump in growth, but that was obvious because you're, we're brand new. We're either going to get bigger or we're going to go out of business. But then it was steady growth, you know, 25, probably average about 25% a year until we get to about um, 2008 and 2009. And those two years, it was right when the recession was happening. Darn. And it was about almost 100% growth two years in a row. And then it went dropped down to like 15% or 20, 15, anywhere from 10 to 25% again for, you know, to, but it started getting more like 10% the last few years. Uh -huh. And then... Um, Last year and this year, it's jumped back up to about 25% growth the last two years. So That's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. It was starting to get, the, we were a year or two, about three years, four years ago, we were under 10% growth, and we're kind of like thinking it wasn't, you know, maybe we reached, reached our peak. So. Yeah. But, uh, wow. It's just, you know, it kind of goes like this, and uh, it's definitely an interesting, um, the seed business is very uh, an interesting business with a tight margin, so you got to keep everything. Yeah, and probably not all that predictable. It's not, and it's very seasonal. So it's kind of like if you mess up, you messed up the whole year, you know, yeah. not just the season. So yeah, Whew. I know gardeners have different ideas of what heirloom seeds or heirloom plants are. Um, how do you define those terms? We're kind of it's kind of a loose term to us. It's kind of it means. Sort of, basically, means a variety that's been passed down from you know family to family. As far as the years where it is, we don't really. It's kind of a loose term like uh, mm -hmm. rare or unique. Mm -hmm. uh, unique is different to different people. Right. Some people will say an orange watermelon is totally unique, and other people, you know, oh, that's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's kind of one of those terms that is kind of like same as antique. You know, what's an antique mm -hmm. to my kids? An antique is, uh, you know. 10 years ago, you know, it seems like a really old, you know, right. they see a catalog sure. from 10 years ago and they think that's like really old. Sure. So it, it kind of depends on, but you know, in general, it's a variety that's been passed down and uh, obviously an older variety. What we really look for is, you know, our main goal is looking for the oldest varieties possible, but we also want to make sure we keep newer varieties that are really good available too. So. Right. Is there any scientific parameters for your seeds that, you, okay, we do this, but we don't do that kind of thing? For us, uh, there's nothing really totally scientific, but what we do is we don't do any hybrid varieties as in F1 hybrids, which is first generation hybrids, which uh, in general that's used in the seed industry to control the genetics so a home gardener can't save the seed without selective breeding to get it to come true okay. again. And we don't offer any patented seeds and obviously we don't offer any genetically modified seeds. So basically any of our seeds, heirloom seeds in general is a term that also suggests that it's a seed that can be saved and traded or sold or whatever you want with it besides like patenting it or like that. You can't really patent something that's, uh, unless you use it for breeding and then you can patent that project you did, but you can't patent the, the seeds. ancient seed because yeah. it's like, it's part of history and you know, it's in public domain. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what makes the seeds interesting. Anybody can do whatever they want with them. They're, they can use them for breeding. They can put them in a vault and keep them safe just in case, mm -hmm. you know. You can grow them, you can sell them, there's no restrictions on them. There's no contracts, like many modern seeds come with a contract that's, you know, like it's about as thick as that book that you've got to sign. So, you know, it gives the 
seed company rights to come on your place and check what you're doing and make sure you're not saving seed and on and on and on, you know, dozens of pages of, you know, rules that give the seed companies and uh, seed breeders a lot of rights to the seed, even though you're growing it, it gives them still ultimate control of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's with the old seeds, it's, you know, everybody can do whatever they want and there's no, uh, no restrictions. Uh, you mentioned putting them in a vault. What's the, I don't, I don't have any idea what the shelf life of the seed is. I mean, how long can you keep a seed? Oh, it's, that's a good question. Nobody really knows. I mean, there's been a date palm, you know, that was uh, germinated that was 2,000 years old. <laughs> But uh, again, you know, it, it varies a lot. I've, I've grown seeds that I bought back in the 90s, early 90s, like 93, a couple of years ago, and they still sprouted fine. But other yeah. times you'll plant seeds that are three or four years old and they're already dead. But in general, most seeds will last. Oh, it varies on the species, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, in general, like your tomatoes, corn, they'll last 10 to 20 years probably if it's just kept in a house. Wow. But it depends on how warm your house is. The warmer the it is and are. the more humid it is, the less life you have. Right, right. So, that makes sense, too. But a, a lot of seeds will germinate for, you know, up to 100 years if they're kept cool and dry. In the beginning, I'm, I'm sure your, your audience was primarily the home gardener. Correct. Um, has that continued to be the case even as you've grown as, as large as you are now? Is the home gardener still your That's, primary? That's, yeah, definitely our main, uh, you know, other companies that went more, you know, to market gardeners or, you know, there's still a lot of home gardeners too, but our audience, we've never really been able to tap into the bigger market growers. There's a lot of specialty growers that grow for like restaurants or really unique things for like a special uh, project. But our varieties don't, uh, most of them don't really incline themselves to going in like grocery store trade mm -hmm. or like that. It's more like people at a farmer's market that might want a really special thing for, mm -hmm. especially like in an area like a, a more metropolitan area where they're looking for something really specialized ingredients, like pink celery or they might want a purple basil or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But um, we have a hard time, you know, just we hear general, we don't really do general farms, you know, it's pretty mm -hmm. much only, you know, specialty growers and probably like 98% home gardeners. Um, nurseries? Do you quite a few nurseries, mm -hmm. quite a few nurseries. Yeah. Again, more like the specialized ones that are mm -hmm. looking for, they want to set themselves apart a little bit. Okay, um, interesting. Would you say that the print C catalog is still at the heart of your operation? I would definitely say it's a good portion, uh, although the internet is, you know, super powerful. Um, Facebook advertising and Instagram ads advertising and so forth has been our biggest growth, uh, our biggest growth factor in the last couple of years. Um, which before we did a little bit of print advertising, which we don't do that much at all anymore. And the catalog, I mean, I think that I think the thing is with the catalog though, most people that even shop online still want to get the catalog though and sit down. They love to sit down, the think about it, mark it all up, yeah. then hop on the on the internet and then order it all. Interesting. So it's uh, people love the year-round reference too, or just being able to take it and show it to grandma or whoever. Right. They love to be able to flip through and show people what they're growing. Do you or does anyone track where your um, where your hits come from, where your sales come from? If they come from print, if they come from internet, sales? it's really hard from the uh, print. Although we we know how many orders we can we can kind of tell how many we're getting in on paper orders. But it's by far the minority is on paper. Although we still get a good chunk, like we probably get uh, about that stack about that big every day, in uh, in the busy season. You know, hundreds of orders every day. But mm -hmm. it's you know, versus thousands of orders on the you know on the internet. So yeah. it's you know probably like I don't know a small. It's in the it's in the single digits overall. Do you envision a time where it will no longer be feasible to do a print catalog and you go completely online? Uh, probably not. Um, probably uh, potentially in the future, though, maybe going to just a charge catalog if, <laughs> if the costs go up. Uh -huh. But I don't ever foresee totally getting rid of the catalog. Yeah. It potentially could go to a, if costs go up enough, it may go to more of a totally paid catalog, but not in the near future. Not, yeah. in, not unless the Postal Service really would change our rates mm -hmm. program. But. Right now, we're happy with everything as long yeah. as uh, as long as the mail system keeps going the way it is and rates stay reasonable. Mm -hmm. If rates go up, though, the only option will be for catalogs is to go to a pay, which I think there'll always be people that want that the catalog copy, though. So. Right. Um, 
How have other technologies changed the way you do business? Well, one of the things we use, um, well, a lot of different things. We kind of blend the old and the new a lot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, of course, Facebook and Instagram, like I mentioned, and, uh, you know, up updating computer systems and so forth and so forth. It's, you know, continual. We want to have, you know, we want to have quick equipment and, you know, the best versions of Photoshop and so forth. But one thing outside of the normal, like, day-to-day -day that most people try to maintain, you know, the newest systems and stuff, we've uh, semi-automated our order picking process. About six years ago, we started work, maybe six or seven years ago, started working on a system where we could just place the seed packets onto a conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. It started out with a tablet, and we would see a person's order, and we'd put them on the conveyor belt, and it would go off to the end and be sorted into individual boxes, and then we would take them and mail them. To now, it... Um, is for the last few years we've had it projected actually on the bin location number so it'll project there from projectors that run up and down the hallways mm -hmm. and it will tell you that we need six of this and seven of that so you're picking actually 20 orders at once but if they want three Cherokee purple packets in that 20 orders you'll, you'll pick them all at once instead of picking one and then walking back and picking it again and again so you basically do 20 orders at once without it cuts down on a lot of steps, in other words. Yes. And then at the end, it automatically sorts them and double checks them versus when people check the orders, oftentimes you end up with the wrong packet in the order. When the machine does it, you know, we're almost 100% successful with the barcodes. Uh, if you order Cherokee Purple, you actually get Cherokee Purple and not Cherokee Green or something else. Yeah. Because it's really easy. And uh, it also weighs it on the scale at the end and prints the postage right there. So you just stick the postage on the bubble wrap mailer and drop it onto another conveyor and it takes it to the uh, pallet box at the end and uh, then it gets picked up from there. So, it's, uh, so the primary, what's the primary advantage there? A reduction in labor costs or more efficiency or... It, uh, it kept us from having to hire on so many part-time people and that we still keep all our permanent people. Mm -hmm. And we've actually increased our number of uh, part-time, you know, overall we've increased our numbers overall mm -hmm. as far as work hours, but it's also because of the growth. But it was also getting to the point where we just couldn't get all the work done in a certain amount of space. Mm -hmm. It was like we have to speed something up because at the point we would peak with 100 people working and you'd have to work in shifts day and night. And we still do that some, but it's made it a lot easier because you'd crowd so many people in to an area trying to pick orders, and you would end up with so many mistakes. And that was our biggest, you know, our biggest worry was, okay, we're getting 5% mistakes or 8% mistakes. This just isn't working. So, I'm, I'm curious. That's, that sounds like a major change. So, you know, how do you go about deciding what system to go with? And, you know, do you, I'm sure you do a lot of investigation. Uh, not really. It was just all the guys here locally, two guys that were here uh, in the neighborhood. One had already started working for us, and the other was, we knew the other guy fairly well. So we started talking with them, and before we knew it, we started putting things together. And they just built everything from scratch. They built everything from scratch. Um, and uh, we have basically, two, it was two different systems, basically, combining the idea of picking by lights, which nobody was really doing yet anywhere as far as we know picking uh, you know picking by light numbers uh, with uh, projector okay. screen or projectors LED projectors and then I'll combine that with a uh, you know sortation system so it's uh, it was complicated but it, it does save us a ton of uh, ton of walking back and forth instead of having to take 20 trips yeah. to get that same item you get all the items for the whole 20 orders in one trip back and forth across the hundred foot long hallway so it's a lot of walking if you have to do it 20 times for every order or not yeah it's basically almost every order you got to do it again so and we're doing it just for all 20 now so it def definitely saves on walking time that's astounding yeah. and the sortation and uh you know barcode readers and all that just totally take out a lot of the you know the headache work the work mm -hmm. that people don't really enjoy yeah and checking off numbers and writing down numbers and double checking People enjoy it a lot more now when they can just mindlessly listen to music, and as long as they just follow the numbers, they can, you know, basically think about whatever they want. Before it was a very mental process. It was totally you would have to keep your mind wrapped around every detail all the time, you know, because now you can just relax and do it. The margin of error is pretty low on that. Almost none, yeah, almost none. So yeah. the only thing that can happen now is if for some reason a packet will get jammed somewhere along the way, and generally that's caught too. So. 
it usually lets us know everything that possibly could go wrong. It's, um, it's almost not not. Well, the the volume and reach of this company now is just mind boggling. Can you um, can you give us an idea of how big it is? Number of employees? We probably have oh somewhere around approaching seventy employees. Mm-hmm. And uh, we mail out, oh, I'm trying to remember, somewhere around 300,000 orders a year, something in that range. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, it might be, it's right around there. You know, I, it, this is, a, the year is still fairly young. Yeah. But um, around 300,000 orders a year to uh, all states and probably around 75 different countries. Right. And, and you said that something about Florida that you, that you, our ma one of our managers is in Florida right now actually uh, getting ready for our plant shipping program, which we just do a little bit on plants. We're not a big, um, we're not a big company like some companies are into plants, but we do uh, probably about 5 or 6% of our business in plants every okay. year. And we ship those out at a company, a uh, farm in Florida grows them for us, so that way we'll have them ready. And it's just really specialty stuff mostly, like um, unusual varieties of bananas or figs or a various assortment of different things that are hard to grow, sweet potatoes, things that are hard to grow from seed. And seed who, growing. Who are your customers for that? Mostly home gardeners, but then there's also, you know, everywhere from like the U.S. Botanical Gardens to, uh, you know, Tokyo Disneyland to, you know, it's just a variety or wide variety of places, you know. It's total, we've sent seeds to like the Antarctic station down, down in Antarctica, you know, for, it's just a wide variety of, you know, you know, interesting places everywhere from, you know, the Vatican City to Dubai to, uh, you know, on and on. And people everywhere are interested in, uh, you know, gardening. You know, it's uh, a, lot, a lot of botanical gardens, though, and also research gardens. Say somebody's searching Black History Month or whatever, and they want to put in an African-American garden. A lot of times they'll research, and, oh, you have the fish pepper. That's the one we need for our garden here in Virginia or whatever. So that happens a lot also. Or they're trying to search a... You know what the Chinese would have been growing in 1950, or so forth and so forth. Sure. A lot of these special requests. Um, you sell to um, agricultural schools and universities. We do, yeah. Uh -huh. a, a lot of a lot of lot go to universities. A lot go to schools too, like grade grade schools. Uh, you know, all sorts of you know public private schools. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, hospitals, prisons. Uh, you name it, pretty much. You know, anywhere that could have a garden. You know, we. At some point, we end up selling to them, you know, different organizations. So. Do, I, that just makes me think, do you have anything like standing orders that you, you just ship, ship out every year to an organization, or, or, or does every year an organization put in an order? Or? Pretty much they put in new yeah. ones. There might be a few that we have that we ship out every year, but mostly they want to pick out new stuff every huh. year. So uh -huh. mostly uh, they come back and send in a new order. And we also do a lot of donations to a lot of the school garden programs. So. Uh -huh. Um, that's our the biggest way schools actually get seeds is asking asking for donations. So we'll probably ship out several hundred thousand packets a year to uh, school garden projects, and then also a lot of seeds go to uh, you know like when, wherever there's like a big disaster area or so forth like that. Well, oh, oftentimes yeah. or or low income areas groups that are working with low income areas or just lots of various projects that are donated as well as. Uh, sold so it's a wide variety of uh, orphanages you know both you know in the Americas but you know all over the globe people write us like hey I'm so and so from Pakistan and I have this school we don't have finances we love your catalog whatever uh -huh. and so they'll you know and then they'll send us letters and photos oftentimes showing us what the kids did with the seeds that they got so and, and if you don't want to answer this it's fine but any government contracts a little bit, a uh -huh. little bit, uh, not not a whole lot, uh -huh. um, but a, a lot of local governments, uh -huh. you know, a lot of local government contracts, and, and various things over the years, and a lot of it I don't even know about, because a lot of times I don't hear, uh -huh. but like our seeds went, um, uh, when we did the, um, oh, the, um, over in Milan, Expo Milano, the World uh, Expo, ex yeah, a few years ago when they had the World Expo going on, they had the American Pavilion, it was all uh, covered in a, a, a vertical garden, which was uh, hydroponic, and it was all covered in our seed varieties. And they, we, uh, one of our guys met with John Kerry when he was setting up for the event, and uh, 
this has been like five or six years ago now, but I never actually got to see it. I got to see photos. He went to it, but I didn't get to go. But it looked amazing. It was all like vertical, and it was all in our heirloom variety. So, you know, projects like that, you know, we get requests for specialty projects when they're looking for a, but as far as like government food projects and stuff like that, it's pretty minimal because mm -hmm. uh, they see us more as a, probably a hobbyist company. Mm -hmm. But so for projects that are more hobby related, though, it's uh, you know we're perfect fit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Baker Creek has one of the largest selections of um, heirloom varieties in the country. But but you also carry heirloom seeds from other countries too. Um, what, what can you tell us about that? You no, know, we started out basically. I was interested in seeds from everywhere. So I, even in the even before we started the company, I started writing people you know on the internet primarily and. Well, pen and paper too, different collectors in Australia and France and various other places and trading seeds. You know, we'd, I'd send them some seeds and they'd send me some seeds. And uh, so I started getting seeds from all over the place right away. And each year we find more and more contacts. So it's kind of uh, one of my special interests. We have two kids from China that we adopted, uh, well, about three years ago, almost three years ago. And I was over there and I started, you know, when I was there, I spread, even before we were there, I was getting things from China from time to time. But after I got there and seen different things, I got, oh, I got to try some of this and I got to try some of that. And, and even before we went to China, I'd been to Japan and so I started collecting seeds from Japan. And before that, it was Thailand. You know, that was 20 years, almost 20 years ago now, I started bringing things from Thailand. So, uh, and then, you know, Spain and Mexico and various other places. So it's like, and then customers will travel to different places and say, hey, here's a uh, bean I found in Iran, or here's a watermelon from Iraq, or here's a uh, sweet potato from wherever. Maybe my uncle in Georgia. So, you know, it's both things international, but it'll also just like all the time, you know, people will send us something that, you know, maybe their ancestors brought over in, you know, 1850. And sometimes they have the story all documented, and other times they have no idea, you know. But uh, Okay, what's the saying? coolest find? In recent years, in recent memory, the coolest thing that I have right now, and he it actually just came in a week or two ago, was uh, something called Chinese wool flower, and uh, it's related to coxcomb and celosia that a lot of home gardeners grow. It's basically the same plant, except this one uh, was in the old uh, American seed catalogs. They said it was brought from China, and it looks like a ball of yarn. It's like threads; they're like long threads. They look just like yarn. And they were illustrated on catalog covers and uh, seed packets. I have seed packets actually right back there. And I was looking and looking and looking. And there's lots of stuff in uh, gardening encyclopedias, like from the 60s and 70s and 80s, talking about this, uh, the wool flower or uh, version of the celosia plant. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I can't find it anywhere. I Googled it and searched it and Googled it. And I searched in Japanese, you know, Googled the Japanese and the Latin name. And, China, uh, try, I searched Chinese and Japanese the best I could, you know, with, uh, and I have a couple friends too, that, so I started talking to them, uh, people that know Japanese and Chinese, and hey, can you guys help me find anything? Didn't hear anything, and they were looking, they found several, you know, the regular celosia, and then a few days in the mail, I could get a packet uh, of seed, of the, uh, one packet of seed that a friend was able to find in the Chinese wool flower, so I'm excited to grow that. It hasn't been, as far as I can tell, the last seed packets for it in the U.S. were probably like in the 50s. Wow. So it's kind of one of those things that totally disappeared kind of off the map. And it's one of the coolest looking. It makes a large, round, globular, yeah. looks like a ball of yarn. Yeah, so, uh, that's you know, things like that. that. And that happens from time to time. You know, it's the Yokohama squash is another one that uh, we didn't find in Japan. We found it in France, but it was originally from Yokohama, Japan. Uh, sent over by uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, first. It was like there, when Japan just opened up in the 1860s. There, I don't remember. It was like a commerce minister or something like that, mm -hmm. ambassador and commerce minister or something like that, trying to build relations with Japan. And his brother was a plant collector, so he sent back all sorts of things like the hosta plants and the Yokohama squash. And the Yokohama squash was in a lot of seed catalogs, but we didn't couldn't find any anywhere in you know the U.S. This was like 20 years ago. And uh, I found a collector in France that was still saving it. So to make a long story short, we started growing it. And uh, three years ago, I we went to Japan. I took a few packets back with me. And 
they have different heirloom seed collectors there looked at it and they said, oh, we have never seen anything like this. And they were pulling up their websites and this must be the descendant of it. This looks some familiar. This is the only Yokohama squash we know of from Yokohama. And it looked similar but different. It wasn't as ribbed. It wasn't as uh, rough looking. The older right. one looked more rough. So they, his, his idea was this, what they have now has probably been a refined, selected version. But they were excited to, you know, I was like passing out packets to them. You know, they were like, excited to get this old squash that had traveled from Japan to France, or probably from Japan to America to France to America again and back. To, and, that, you know, this happens all the time with seeds. Yeah. So. yeah. And those are the kind of, you know, stories that we unearth and... Uh, and and right is right here from the Ozarks. I mean, the Millionaire Tomato was um, a popular variety. A lot of older people would come in. This was in the '90s, like '98 to 2000, early 2000s. They would come in and say, "Do you have the Millionaire Tomato?" And one old man was crying when he found out we didn't have any. He said, "Oh, I was hoping you were my last hope." My grandma, or I think it was a mom or grandma, grew up back in the like '40s or something like that for all the local canneries we had here in Missouri. Yeah. And he couldn't find it anywhere. And finally, we found seeds in Canada. And um, a person in Canada was, uh, had saved them. And they actually got them from a person here in Norwood, Missouri. And they kept them alive up there. And they sent us seeds back. And uh, for a few years, a lot of people would come in and be all excited to find the millionaire tomato that they remember the canneries growing. And then gradually, a lot of those older people you know, quit gardening. Yeah. And there's not as much enthusiasm. People still are excited to hear the story, but the original people that are gar doing it, a lot of them aren't gardening anymore. So right. A lot of people now just have the story. So. But that's fascinating. But yeah, those are the kind of stories that make the, you know, it's, and all, almost all the seeds have stories. A lot of them, it's just, it's really difficult locating the people, you know, who have the story. So. Yeah, it, I, that's just a whole other avenue. Is like the history of seeds. I mean, you know, do, do you have a seed from... Thomas Jefferson's garden at Monticello or something. I mean, that's just fascinating. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. We do have seeds like he grew, you know, because he documented different things that he grew. So we do have different crops that he grew, a few. And, uh, you know, there's crops. Uh, Japan has a lot of really good records of crops, and there's still things we're looking for. For example, in Japan, they developed uh, uh, domesticated dandelions in all different colors, and uh, like black flower dandelions and so forth. And they were in old woodcut artwork from like the 1500s. But as far as we can tell, you know, they lost interest. Other things came, you know, they started working on the chrysanthemums or whatever, and they lost interest. And uh, there may still be a collector somewhere, though. You know, we like we have our different people looking for us now. You know, this, maybe these things will show up again. Oftentimes, like there's a, an old American watermelon called ice cream watermelon. It was a... There's several small white-fleshed watermelons, but the ice cream watermelon was a large white-fleshed watermelon. And it was in all the old, not all the old seed catalogs, but many, many old seed catalogs from like the 1860s, 70s, 80s, especially around the 1880s. And it's totally, you know, disappeared as far as we can tell. It's, uh, and so a lot of varieties have totally disappeared, but who knows? Maybe one day somebody from somewhere will show up with that variety. Gosh, you and, can uh, spend a lifetime investigating. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. no end of searching. Yeah. And it could be in some hidden valley in Pakistan or China or Russia, right. and they've kept or, it going. Or in White County. Or, or it might just be right around here. Yeah. Although, with this many years going by, you start kind of, um, yeah, you start after a while. There's still hidden things here, but you start, you, with the Internet, so much gets told. It's right. nothing's unique anymore, and there's enough people looking that a lot of times a neighbor or somebody will say, look at this a crazy watermelon my neighbor is growing. Uh, so with the internet, it's made it a lot easier, uh, yeah. and uh, and it's made it even easier to search internationally. But the places where things are still hiding are really remote areas where people aren't using the internet sure. a whole lot, sure. or uh, areas, tribal areas where people just aren't, or sometimes with really older people that just don't think it's that exciting, but they've just kept it going because they always have had have yeah. had it in their family or whatever, and they don't even realize that it's unique, so it doesn't the story doesn't get out there. So your, your passion for seeds and plants also um, ultimately led you to, to finding a spouse, is that correct? Correct, yeah. My wife uh, actually found out about, I guess, me and the company through our seed catalog, which some friends of hers had. And uh, I don't know when exactly she saw the catalog, probably in the, I think in the early 2000s or around, maybe around right after Y2K, somewhere in that area, they first started getting our catalog. And we met in... Uh, early 2006 and got married later in 2006. And her name? Emily. Emily, yeah. And uh, then we, uh, 
and from there on out, we started, you know, that was the first year we put it in the warehouse, too, our first yeah. warehouse. So that was basically when the business, it went from uh, mostly at that point, even in 2005, a lot of people were, it was very seasonal. So from that por- period on, we started kind of, uh, it's been a gradual process, but it was be- kind of, finally became more of a uh, trying to get things more organized in a business mm-hmm. fashion. And uh, then we have uh, we had two kid, two daughters, Sasha and Malia, and they're uh, twelve and six. Mm-hmm. And then uh, three years ago, we adopted two children from China, uh, Ella and Sion, and they're uh, five and fourteen. Yeah, wow. So. Okay. And and so you're you, you're both life partners and business partners. Yeah, yeah, that's so. that's that's great. Um, well, shifting gears just a little bit, what what insights can you provide uh, about the seed propagation? industry in general um is it growing is it changing um it, it's changing a lot i mean for a while you know it was uh it was it, it's always changing but you know it was the small scale seed production was it was really hard at first because we were kind of caught in the middle between a lot of the companies were going out of business the seed producers then we would produce seed here but it was only so much we could reduce so we started relying on a network of small growers and that worked pretty well, although some, some growers can't grow enough of what we need. So uh, it's kind of like working to get more growers that have more equipment or more or able to invent equipment to process certain things. There's certain things like radish seed would take forever, you know, sitting there opening the radish seed pods, taking out the radish seed. So over the last few years, we started finding more like larger growers as in the uh, sense they don't really have a daytime job besides seed production, but they're still tiny, you know, mm-hmm. in the overall scheme of things. But uh, they're, they've are they able to, you know, produce enough seed to now make that like a full-time seed production job. Mm-hmm. But we're looking for more and more of those kind of like full-time seed producers that can process unusual seeds, not necessarily unusual seeds, but hard to produce seeds like cabbage and you know, things that aren't like tomatoes, which everybody, you know, all of our smaller growers can grow, grow right. those really easily because the process seems easier. But uh, so that's been, uh, that's been our biggest change is finding these growers that are still in business because a, a lot of the older growers have went out of business and the seed industry changed and got bigger and bigger and bigger. So now we're finding these kind of niche specialty growers and it's usually just them and a lot of times they will contract with two or three other farmers or whatever. So they, so they have the isolation distance to produce these seeds. Because all, a lot of these seeds will cross with other, you know, you can't grow two carrots. I think carrots need like a couple miles apart. Uh-huh. So you, they got to kind of network with farmers in the valley or their area to try to produce several varieties of carrots. And, uh-huh. so the, and that's, our, that's our biggest challenge is finding uh, enough growers to grow, say, all of our different corn varieties, for example. Yeah. And corn cr- wind pollinates, so it can pollinate for miles. And it also can contaminate, you know, easily with like patented GMO varieties. It can... If you get it too close to another variety, say your red corn can get yellow kernels in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so all these things, you know, make it more and more difficult to, uh, so it, it just basically t- requires a lot of research and finding growers who are isolated. Maybe growers outside the area where corn is n- normally grown, you know, commercially, they might mm-hmm. be on marginal areas. And finding varieties that work up north and you can gr- grow things where commercial corn isn't normally growing. Or in valleys, hidden valleys, where mm-hmm. somebody might have a little pocket in the valley. So, right. And that's been, and then we test all of our corn for purity as well. So, uh-huh. so on the corn crops in particular, because it's such a big issue. Do you have laboratories here that you test things? We send everything on. Yeah, yeah, in general, yeah. yeah. Um, what's been the impact of corporate farms? The seed industry has changed a lot over the years as seed companies merge and become bigger and bigger. A lot of times, the biggest impact on the seed industry this is the seeds themselves it's the varieties disappearing when monsanto or any other company buys another company it's just natural you're not going to want to keep all the varieties of that seed company going forward it's just you know just business sense and uh you know you don't you don't want to keep the low sellers from another company when you take it over it mm-hmm. just it, and so that's a lot of the companies unfortunately you know pa dies or ma dies Mm-hmm. And the kids don't have the enthusiasm, so another company, the only option left is to sell it. Yeah. There's no enthusiasm there, so oftentimes it sells uh, for various reasons. That's one of the reasons, and invariably, you know, the number of varieties goes down each, with each sale, and every time it sells, it gets cut more. 
So, you know, the right, amount of variety commercially gets less and less. On the other hand, there's, you know, a lot of small seed companies who started up and a lot of internet businesses and a lot of interest from the general public in, you know, genetically unique varieties and colorful tomatoes and so forth. So you're kind of seeing an overall commercial trend down, but then you're also seeing a trend up with a lot of small businesses, internet businesses, eBay businesses, businesses and so forth. So it's kind of like as it goes away, there's another movement coming up to preserve it. Yeah. So, is your business um, sort of in tune with environmentalism and sustainability, and are those issues of importance to to your to your business? Our business, we try to keep everything as environmentally friendly as possible, yeah. and on the farm here, you know, we use all organic practices mm -hmm. and try to keep everything. You know, we want to see not only the seeds survive and thrive, but also the pollinators and uh, the, you know, the whole, you know, everything in the garden, all the insects and frogs and Delicious. birds and all the, you know, we want to keep it all, all together. On that being said, on the other hand, I mean, I can understand, uh, we use organic pesticides, but I can understand how gardeners sometimes get frustrated <laughs> when they're growing blueberries or something. And it's like they just throw in the towel and say they're going to go spray whatever on those things. <laughs> Cause, uh, but uh, yeah, we use all organic and sometimes we will just, you know, lose a crop. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you've got to realize if you're going to do organic, there's certain things you just can't go in an area, you know, it's just like, um, you know, not commercially anyway. You might be able to do it in a hoop house or if you net it or whatever. Right. But as far as just like growing acres of certain crops, uh, like cucumbers here, there's so many cucumber beetles mm -hmm. in our immediate area that we can never really grow cucumbers successfully outdoors. Mm -hmm. So we've switched to putting them inside the high tunnels and they do beautifully. Okay. So it's uh, a lot of times it's switching, and and we don't really do cu cucumber seed here, other than a few, a few special varieties that we need to increase production. But as far as, like, uh, seed production in general for cucumbers, it ha it's it's too expensive to do it in a high tunnel because the cost per right. greenhouse. So basically, looking for, you know, where they think grow best is I think the best environmental choice for seed production is uh, looking for where they do good, where they thrive naturally. Mm -hmm. and growing as much as, as we can here on the farm and in the Midwest. But then there's certain crops like beans and peas, you just don't get a good quality seed unless you're in a dry climate. So. Right. Well, that brings up another question. Your seed store here, all the seeds that you grow in that store, can, uh, that you have in that store, can they grow in this in the Ozarks? They can. Again, like with the cucumbers, those certain things might yeah. require. And other people, though, just in the neighborhood here, like our, one of our managers in the store, he grows cucumbers fine, and he's like 12 miles from here. So uh -huh. a lot of times it's trial and error, your immediate area. You might be in by an area that naturally attracts these insects. But from a climate standpoint? In or, general, most of them yeah. do well. Sometimes we get way too much rain. That's okay. the, you know. But on a dry year, you can, as long as you have irrigation, you can grow pretty much anything. On a wet year... Certain crops just, you know, at some point, even the crops that like a lot of water, like last year almost, we got 20 inches in the month of uh, was it May last year. Mm -hmm. Even the things that like a lot of water, that was getting a little bit much. It was yeah. like Wet feet. flood and yeah. then flood and then flood for yeah. 20, 30 days. It's, so, but in general, yeah, in general, we have a lot of varieties that do well. And looking for varieties from like tropical and subtropical climates mm -hmm. tend to do better here in the Ozarks or varieties from like Arkansas or Louisiana or mm -hmm. Georgia, trying to get varieties from England to do well here, you want to only do those in the cooler seasons of the okay. year, like spring or fall, because mm -hmm. they don't like the, in general, English varieties really don't like our Julys and August. So. Right. Well, you have, a, you have an international business here. What are the positive and negative factors that impact your business on a global scale? Um, Oh, it's the positive factor, of course, is the internet as far as being able to connect with people everywhere. That's mm -hmm. the, um, the big driver behind being able to get stuff out and mm -hmm. get our varieties in various places. The biggest uh, deterrent probably is all the regulations. And mm -hmm. in general, we just ship seeds if somebody orders them to wherever. But then uh, sometimes, depending on the governments and what restrictions they have and requirements they have, we may or may not be able to meet all the requirements, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for each individual country. That's the biggest challenge. It's so much to keep up with. It's a lot to keep up with, and generally we just tell the customers it's on them if, uh, you know, they got to keep track of it. And oftentimes we'll place the order once or refund their shipping and the, or refund their order if they can't get it through. And most orders go through, and most countries don't really regulate that heavily. But uh, Australia, for example, wants scientific names on everything. 
And then certain crops in each envelope, they may pull out. Like, I don't remember if it's tomatoes or something. You know, there's always some crop that some country has on a, a banned list or a restricted list if it doesn't have much special paperwork. Right. So it's that's our biggest, uh, you know, deterrent for yeah. doing more business overseas is uh, simply the amount of paperwork or uh, research that's required. Well, your operation here has changed through the years, obviously. Baker Creek is more than just uh, an heirloom seed company, though. You've, you've sort of embraced uh, the concept of agritourism with um, Bakersville Village here and, and with festivals and tours and year-round activities. Um, tell us a little, about, about, a little bit about the marriage of agriculture and tourism. What are, what are the advantages of moving in that direction? Well, shortly after our marriage, me and my wife, we started thinking, you know, I'd been set up down at Silver Dollar City, and I enjoyed, you know, educating people about the different varieties at their fall festival there for several years. And then we got married, and we did another year down there with me and my wife. And mm -hmm. we started thinking it would be fun to do, you know, we were already doing festivals and stuff here. And, you know, basically even early on, before the village or anything, I thought the festivals would be great to bring people together, share ideas, share um, seeds and plants, and get to bring all the, you know, all the different enthusiasm for the older writers together, and uh, you can learn so much. So that's where that kind of started. And then in 2006, we got married. 2007, we started putting in a few small buildings besides the seed store and the barn. And mm -hmm. so we started adding a little by little and adding a few more buildings, and we were adding another warehouse or two. And so it was kind of basically a, um, you know, kind of the idea of, having a place where not just the festivals, but, you know, we could have people come out and enjoy an afternoon anytime, uh, you know, anytime we're open. Sure. So it was basically the idea to, and, you know, put in more greenhouses and gardens. People like to come and tour the greenhouses and the gardens, and uh, it's a, a great place for people to come and meet. Uh, like today, I have a guy coming from Holland, I believe either today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He's going to show up sometime whenever he gets here. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk about tulip bulbs with me. So you know we got a, we got a lot of tulip bulbs out there. They're not planted yet, mm -hmm. or they're not they're not blooming yet. They were planted last fall. So mm -hmm. anyway, we all all the time we get different seed people coming from. This year we've had people from Japan and several from multiple people from Holland and uh, various other places. You know, from time to time China and England and uh, just all all over the planet actually. Where different seed people when they're traveling through the U.S. We'll get them to stop by. And, yeah. Then we just get people that are passing through that looked up something to do in the area and they come by. And sometimes we'll just get people that are, you know, wanting to kind of get, feel like, you know, they want to get out of the city for a sure. day. Sure. So the police come down from St. Louis or Springfield or wherever and just want to take the kids to run around out on a farm. And yeah. We get people, some of the people come here every day almost and they'll jog around our loop here on the oh, little yeah. travel loop. <laughs> and then they'll sit here and play a game or whatever. They'll, That's wonderful. So it brings people out, especially in the nicer months. People will come out and have a picnic or eat in a little restaurant here. Yeah. <coughs> come out and talk to the chickens or yeah. something. Just to, uh, you know, some people are regulars and other people are you know, occasional. So. Yeah, and so it's a, there's an educational factor there, too. Educational yeah. and relaxing. And, yeah. uh, and some people just come out to, you know, some people, if they're into flowers, when the flowers are blooming, they'll come out and go through the flowers or come out and taste different varieties, you know. Yeah. So. Well, you've also exported that kind of activity with your Heirloom Expo, I believe. Is that correct? It is. Yeah, in yeah. California, we yeah. started that. It's, this will be the 10th year. That's amazing. And uh, we have a wide variety of speakers. And uh, people come together from all over, again, all over the planet to the Expo. And uh, a great experience to actually see the produce. This event, we have our big event in Missouri. is in the spring every May. And it's more like plants and seeds and everybody's getting ready to garden and the one in California is more like the harvest there where it's all produced already. Right. And I, I know you have stores now located in California and Connecticut, but your, your headquarters is still here where it all started. Correct. Yeah, we're here in well, primarily where we do business is here out of, all our shipping's out of here out of Missouri and then we have a store and we have trial grounds both here in California. So. And it still makes sense to be centered here in the Ozarks? I think so, yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Um, we like uh, the shipping situation is good here because we can ship to the east and west coast. Although it's still a distance, it's closer than being on one coast to the other. Sure. And we do a lot of shipping to both coasts. And then we do also, also really a, our kind of our core business, a lot of it is in uh, a lot of these Midwestern states, Missouri, Illinois, Ohio, 
-hmm. and then the mid Atlantic states like uh, Pennsylvania is huge, you know, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Virginia, all that area, Indiana, mm -hmm. Ohio, that's Tennessee. That wow. whole region is, you know, huge for our customer base. That's fabulous. That's well, our core. Yeah. You've been, you've been very generous. I, I want to end up asking you, um, how do you envision the future of Baker Creek Airland and Seas? Do you, you know, what's, what's next on the horizon? Are, are there any ideas that you would like to, uh, to try that you haven't explored yet with the company? It's always, uh, you know, it's always interesting where we're going. We never really know. I don't plan ahead a lot. It's just kind of usually hanging on, and there's always new ideas. One thing we're working on right now is we're putting in a new warehouse, uh, and shipping facility, which will be a lot bigger than our current facilities over in Seymour, Missouri. So we're actually going to be moving uh, the shipping off-site, uh, hopefully in the next next 12 months or so. So, uh, And uh, actually, you know, with the change, updating everything and making everything more streamlined. We built the warehouses. Where we started out with the seed store, and the warehouse was basically in the seed store. And then we added on our first warehouse and started shipping out of there. And uh, then we added the second warehouse and the third warehouse, so we're kind of like broken up. So, and the call center's in another location, and our media office is in another location. And so uh, we're going to bring everything together under a 53,000 square foot building in Seymour. So wow. getting ready to work on that. So it'll be about three, four times as big as all of our buildings currently. So it will give us enough space so we are won't hopefully run out of space again real quick. So wow, that's exciting. We need a little more room to spread out. Everything's really crammed and stacked and stacked under and above and underneath the warehouse. And, you know, a lot of areas, uh, you know, it, it just isn't convenient right now. So we're working on uh, another thing that, we've do that we're doing is we're actually in the process of uh, selling the place in Connecticut. And that's basically what we're working on is uh -huh. trading that for a bigger warehouse here. So. I see. Although we love Connecticut, the new owners are going to do a great job. They're already, uh -huh. they're already bait. The new owners have been, uh, you know, taking care of the business and running everything for years. So it'll still so. remain a seed company. Yeah, it's, not, uh, it's not seed company and natural grocery store. That's okay. what they're doing with yeah. it. So it's going to be a, uh, the same. It's not going to change. It's just, uh, you know, in any big way anyway for the near future. But, uh, well, no, so, it's, the, so it's a bright future for. I think so. Seed. I think everything, and uh, I think it's a, you know. Uh, overall a good time to be in the seed industry. I mm -hmm. mean, it's lots of ups and downs and uh, turn, twists and turns with uh, technology and Amazon and there's so many different things that uh, sure. for better and for worse, you know, uh -huh. change the way people, like for us, for example, part of the reason, you know, we switched to the last year and this year is going to 100% free U.S., Canada, and Mexico shipping is simply because, you know, Amazon's there and, and others now that are, you know, offering that so it's kind of like uh, we were the first seed company, well, at least more moderate size seed company anyway. But there might be a few online sellers, but really the first seed company that produces a catalog to offer, to you know, totally free shipping, especially to Canada and Mexico. So it's kind of like, on the other hand, though, you know, we have to you, st you start thinking about you know competition out there and where things are going. You know, people are used to that two-day, you know, of free course. shipping and. Unfortunately, we can't get to the two day and remain free at this point. Yeah. But our, you know, our our dollar point is you can order a one pack of seeds still, and that's our one advantage. You know. Yeah. You can order one package of seeds, and we can two dollars and fifty cents packet. You can still get free shipping. Yeah. So that's one. That's our only area where you know we can keep up with competition. You know, in the in the seed front because it's definitely changing. People are used to stuff. You know free shipping now so it's like and that's also made our business you know all of a sudden people that were ordering you know two or three times a year now feel like they can order six times a year so <laughs> it's totally uh it's been well worth it for us yeah yeah it's been well a, you're doing something right well, I don't know about that. we feel blessed to you know be able to do what we do and it's a great uh, operation it's uh you know i think the biggest thing is if you make the customers happy and we try to make the customers happy as much as we can and uh I mean, I think as long as any business in the, you know, in, in, not just the United States, but almost any country, as long as you have a, something people want and can keep it consistent, I mean, I think that's the main thing. It's hard. And that's the challenge for, you know, all of us every day is sure. whether you're making a loaf of bread or a seed packet, it's keeping that consistency and keeping the customers happy day in and day out. It's, that's a, well, you seem to be doing it well. Oh, I don't know. We, we struggle like everybody else, but it's <laughs> a lot of fun trying anyway. So. Dear, this has been just delightful. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.